as the next spot on our tour, really to point out this building, the uh, building with the, the large glass windows. And that's what's considered a sliver building in New York City. And um, it's a building that's um, on a very narrow lot that is, is much higher than, than its surroundings and much higher kind of with the proportion of its lot. And so I think really as a result of this building, uh, New York City passed a sliver law uh, to address sliver buildings um, uh, to basically prevent buildings like this from, from being constructed in the future. This, this building, I, th I think if there are residents here of 96th Street or this area, I think this, right, uh, very controversial when it was constructed. Right, and took down a, a townhouse, a wonderful mansion, so exactly. that was also an issue. And so the sliver buildings are very threatening to historic structures, which, which many people value in New York. So you can see... Uh, was it in the 1980s, I believe? Yes. And so um, you can see the building next to it, which I would imagine kind of approximates the scale and style and, and age of the building that, that predates the Sliver building. And that's now the Italian School. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. yes, thank you. There are really amazing nonprofits and organizations in this uh, area. And uh, actually, one of them is having a street fair. So, um, with uh, the, not to get too overly detailed with the Sliver building, uh, this is a 16-story building on a 22-foot wide lot. And so what's considered a sliver building is a building that's on a lot of 45 feet or fewer. And um, now when buildings on those narrow lots are constructed, uh, the height needs to equal the width of the neighboring structure or 100 feet. So that's a little bit complex, but next time you see a building like that, a sliver building, you'll kind of understand how that works. And of course on Lower Broadway in Soho, we have a lot of this type of building. That was a very kind of common um, industrial type of building a hundred years ago. But I think many people feel that this is not exactly a, a, an appropriate structure for, a, uh, for this type of neighborhood and, and certainly in its kind of current iteration and its impact on historic structures. Yes. Is that not the one where they had to cut off some of the this top of the building? Or? That's actually next. We'll be talking oh, about oh. that. And just to get us out of the smoke, I'm just going to discuss one other thing and then we'll move along. Um, so you can't really see it, and some of you may be very familiar, but... Um, there is a uh, facade of a historic armory just a block south of here, and so it's literally only a facade. I, the armory was um, demolished in the 1960s. I think there was a major citizen outcry at that time to save the armory, and really the only thing that was saved was just that facade. So um, immediately to the east of the facade is uh, Hunter High School, and, um, and that structure was built, I think, in the 1980s uh, to really kind of approximate the scale and style of an arsenal which is kind of an interesting take to have a, a high school that looks like a fortress, so you can kind of judge whether or not you, you like the design of that or not. But, um, but this is an example of, of what is called in the world of preservation facadectomy, where you really leave only the facade of a building, um, uh, but nothing else remains. So, so facadectomy, so like cutting something off, <laughs> leaving only the facade. And there are multiple examples of this uh, around New York, and. And I think actually DC has a lot of um, different examples of historic facades that re remain, but none of the rest of the structure remains. So we're going to walk uh, just a block east uh, to Park Avenue and we'll take a, a stop in the median and we'll